Hello and welcome to Business Today Television. I'm Siddharth Zarabi and you're watching our market time coverage here on Business Today TV. And with me now is Amur S. Lakshmi Narayanan, the Managing Director and CEO of Tata Communications. Welcome to the show, um, Lakshmi. Uh, I want to begin uh, by uh, narrating a very small anecdote about uh, this company for those viewers and new entrants to the markets and tracking the economy and companies that Tata Communications was actually known as Videsh Sanchar Nigam Limited and it was the company that actually laid the foundations of the internet revolution in India way back, way back in 1995 if memory serves me right was the time when the first public uh, internet connections were made available and that was in some ways even pre-dial-up era uh, but uh, Lakshmi I digress. Uh, uh, we are in the present in 2023, a first quarter behind you, um, a bit of a damper as far as the numbers uh, are concerned. Uh, before I go into other questions, just for our viewers, uh, what's really been happening? Why, why this uh, dip in, uh, in your profitability and the overall financial performance? Yeah, hi Siddharth, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I think just to digress again, you know, when we talked about VSNL, uh, you know, Tata's had uh, invested in the company, but the history goes uh, even before that, uh, Siddharth, I was amazed to learn that the first uh, submarine cable, you know, between uh, England and India was laid in the 1850s. Um, and, and that's when the, the, the communication sort of revolution began and it became OCS, then VSNL. Then after Tata's uh, acquired it, uh, they made a few other acquisitions, uh, really strengthening our core capability. Today, our fiber runs around the world, right? So we are one of the largest players. A third of the world's internet um, is uh, published on our network. So, you know, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a brief history. It goes back even, even, even way before that. So we're very mm -hmm. proud to have that, uh, that heritage. Now coming to this Q&A, uh, so uh, the question on, yes, the profits uh, have dipped. Uh, but that's uh, uh, exactly as per the, the strategy that we had laid out, right? So uh, in terms of uh, the company's data revenues, uh, we split that between core connectivity and uh, digital products and services, right? So those are the two parts. And, and we've been saying that the core connectivity world over is actually degrowing, right? Uh, but we have taken efforts to transform the network, address certain segments of large customers, and we would, uh, and we said that that segment of core connectivity would grow by uh, a, a low to mid signal digit is what we've been saying that would grow. And therefore, in order to really grow the company, uh, we have to invest in digital platforms and services, which is what we said. Now, digital platforms and services has a very different characteristics of profitability. Right? While core connectivity came with a higher profitability, it required a high level of CapEx investments to be made on all the fiber everywhere and, and, and high CapEx business. Whereas the digital products and uh, services come with uh, lesser CapEx, but the, the, at the gross margin levels, uh, it's not at the same levels of profitability of this. And even within the digital portfolio, we have multiple uh, families of products, if you will. And each of these families um, have a very different margin profiles. It's very well known fact, uh, for example, in CPAS, you know, the, the margin profiles are very different and it's a, and we are betting in that space. We are, you know, we, we launched a platform called Digo, which is growing extremely well. We just announced an acquisition in that space of Calera. So these margin profiles are very different. So the first reason for the, the margin dip is the mix of revenue from a core connectivity in data to the digital portfolio. Right? And our digital portfolio was, uh, you know, in the, in the 20s, two, uh, two years ago. Uh, this quarter, it's come to 34%, right? So we are increasing the digital component of our data portfolio. And with that, there is going to be pressure on the at the gross revenue level. The second reason um, is, again, we had called out last year that we are going to be investing um, in uh, in people, both at the front end of the sales in, uh, in the markets, especially the international markets, where um, today our revenue share in the international markets is small. Uh, and we believe there is a big upside and white space available in the international market. So we said we will invest that. The second is we said we would invest in continuing to strengthen our products and platforms 
uh, and building solutions. So there again, you know, they added over a thousand people last year, and that cost is coming into um, you know in the last few quarters, and you know we are seeing the effect of that fully uh, uh, through this year. Now, these are the two reasons uh, what uh, uh, you see as the main reasons, and third, of course, is um, you know some of the inorganic growth uh, that we have invested in. Uh, and related M&A expenses um, have come this quarter. So broadly, these are the expenses and the reasons why the margins are, are what they are. But you know, this is exactly uh, what we had said we would do. Uh, we had given this strategy. This is a narrative that we've been telling and you know our strategy in Investor Day, and we are executing uh, to the dot uh, to what we said we would do in our strategy. So I'm very pleased with the execution that the company is uh, is demonstrating. In terms of the strategy, uh, and you've given us some elements of that, I want to understand from you, and again for the viewer, there was a time that Videsh Sanchar was an absolute monopoly. The only way uh, India was connected uh, to the rest of the world was through Videsh Sanchar, and today also uh, Tata Communications or Tata Videsh Sanchar, if you may call it that, and I'm not trying to rebrand the company on a live interaction, uh, has a core play in that. Tell the sort of new investor in the market who looks at your company where you stand vis-a-vis -vis competition today. Yeah. You have you have other companies that have invested in uh, submarine uh, data sure. transfer capabilities. Uh, yeah. How would you describe uh, your company to them? Yeah. So the way I uh, describe the company is we are a company evolving to become a comtech as opposed to being a telecom company, right? Uh, and there are good and early signs of that. If you look at the financial metric, um, uh, four years ago, our uh, ROSI was at uh, eight, nine percent, and our EBITDA margins were at uh, 16 percent. Today, we are saying that we will be about 25 percent in our ROSI. Uh, we are saying that you know, we aspect to be in the 23 to 25 percent range in the EBITDA. So already we are exhibiting characteristics that are very different from a, a regular telecom player. Right, so uh, that is one. So we are on our path to become a, what we are building on is our core strength, which is the power of our network, you know, uh, uh, which is what I explained to you, you know, a, a third of the world's internet uh, is on our network. We have a very large messaging infrastructure around the world. We have a, a large voice infrastructure around the world. And these are the core uh, foundation, if you will, of, uh, of what we have. And on top of that, we are building these platforms that will address the digital needs of our customers. So for example, the, B2, the B2C customers of ours, when they want to interact with their consumers, today they have many challenges because those, uh, how they interact with the consumers are very fragmented. So people do SMS, people do WhatsApp, people do voice, and there are many, many interaction channels that are there. With our Digo platform, with our customer interaction platform, we are converging all these conversations and interactions with their consumers and also bringing intelligence to make it more contextual. So that is the platform that we are working on. That's the platform that we've launched. So we are building um, capabilities on top of this. Now, what is this platform leveraging? That platform is leveraging our voice capabilities. The platform is leveraging our, um, our messaging capabilities around the world. So that's what it's leveraging on, but we have built these capabilities on top. The second thing is, uh, we are differentiated from other players in the in the field uh, by the fact that we are a B2B specialist, right? We are not a, a B2C player also doing a B2B. Um, and, and, and that requires a different characteristics, a different mindset. So in our strategy, we had called out that we want to be focused on large enterprises. Uh, we created a team that focuses on learning about the customers and servicing them well. And it reflects well, you know, if you look at our NPS course, it's amongst the highest, not just in our industry, but across many other industries globally. Our NPS scores are uh, are some of the uh, is the highest. Right? So these are some of the ways by which we uh, we differentiate, and and we are uh, betting on these platform play on top of this core foundation that we have built, which is very strong. Uh, data is the new oil, and as far as data is concerned, you also um, outlined. Uh, um, significant target uh, over the next three to four years where what will be the main drivers for you to achieve the target that you outlined right i think the uh, there are you know three main drivers so if you look at our portfolio of what we are doing right 
um, we are essentially saying that we want to become a digital fabric for the enterprises, right? Uh, and the uh, digital fabric, uh, you know, we say that we address three parts of it. One part is about the digital and agile infrastructure, which is how do I help customers to utilize the internet more effectively? Uh, you know, and and people are using inter the business users are using internet. Uh, people are moving to cloud. So the, the drivers of that agile infrastructure, which comprises of our next generation connectivity solutions, it mm. comprises of our cloud solutions, and we are launching our edge solution there as well, and everything software defined. So that's what is the, the is that portfolio of digital infrastructure. And the, the drivers for growth in that portfolio is going to be enterprises moving to cloud, enterprises moving to internet, uh, and as they do that, the, the architecture becomes quite complex. It becomes, shall we say, less secure as well. You know, while convenience increases, security becomes uh, an issue. And in our portfolio, we focus on you know end-to-end -end security of how we offer that. And so the drivers are internet, the drivers are cloud, and people go from cloud to cloud as well. So we are launching a product that will connect multiple clouds together and deliver that capability to our customers. So that's the, those are the drivers for the digital infrastructure growth. If you look at the connected experiences where we have our move platform, uh, which is essentially delivering the capability of connected cars. Uh, it helps uh, in, in smart lighting, where are several cities in India runs our solution for smart lighting to uh, to deliver the uh, you know, both the citizen experience as well as uh, all the environmental benefits that it offers so all our connected solutions addresses these kind of uh, areas and the drivers for that growth is the proliferation of devices um, the internet of things that are need to be connected uh, and that interacts with the people and the businesses so we look at man machine material uh, and all of them coming together creating new business opportunities uh, for customers. Right? So as connected cars go into market, how do you connect all of them? How do you drive services revenue on top of it? So these are the new drivers and connected solutions. Uh, the drivers of growth would be uh, these elements of proliferation of devices, the need for connectedness of devices to people and, uh, and applications. The third portfolio is all connected uh, experiences. And I talked to you briefly about it. So one is about employee experience that we deliver through you know such collaboration using the uh, tools like you know zoom and team and cisco tools and others how do we enable that and deliver that service the second part of it is all the connected experiences for consumers and uh, the interaction that we talked about so there largely we help customers moving to uh, their call centers to cloud putting the technology on the cloud um, converging all the customer interactions through a single platform and make it easy to consume. So, um, you know, if you have seen some of the recent results of the uh, uh, the US banks, one of them stands out. They have said that the number of branches have come down by 4%, whereas the digital interactions have gone up quite significantly, right? And the revenues have been very resilient for this bank. So these digital interactions are going to grow and that's one uh, will be the growth driver for our customer experiences platform. And the third is all about the uh, uh, the, the area of you know, how we deliver uh, the uh, all of them together in a stitched up manner as solution. Right. right? So these are uh, these are essentially the the key drivers uh, that we are mapping to our customers, and our portfolios are very neatly aligning to these drivers. Right. Uh, since you s spoke about these priorities, uh, you, you this company has acquired several other companies. Uh, is the phase of significant investments, uh, especially those driven by m and over, or is uh, something still on the horizon? Um, so if I understood your question, um, you, uh, you, you're, uh, you're referring to the uh, recent acquisitions that we have just announced. And uh, I think our strategy, Siddharth, is uh, obviously the organic engine is, is growing. And this is what we showed in this quarter. Organically, we have grown 14% year on year. And the inorganic has added another uh, few percentage points to our growth uh, in this quarter. Hmm. And the way we are going about the inorganic uh, acquisition is uh, driven by more strategy than necessarily just uh, bulking up our, uh, our, our growth, right? 
So we are looking at, uh, you know, for example, uh, the acquisition of the Switch, uh, which is one of the major players in uh, in the Americas, to deliver um, all the sporting events that are happening in the in the stadiums to the millions of uh, viewers uh, sitting at home, uh, and that very neatly fits in with our media portfolio. Uh, we are a leader already in the media portfolio for uh, all the global events uh, taking to global. Um, uh, consumers, right? So Formula One, or Formula E, we do ATP tennis, we do Sail GP, and 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 many more, many many more sporting events. You know, the last few years, we cover nearly twenty thousand sporting events a year, and our media is right at the center. Cricket, for example, you know, we are the major players bringing all the cricket to all the fans here as well. So, we uh, our media plays a very significant part, and we are focused on these global events, taking to global consumers. Now, what? This acquisition, then uh, the switch does, is very neatly brings a very solid presence in the Americas with all the local sporting events, or the football and everything else, taken to the local uh, uh, viewers in in the U.S. But it's a significant market, uh, so it expands our market reach, uh, if you will. That's one strategic rationale, hmm. and the second is. The switch also comes with a, a capability called uh, the production. I mean, you being in the media business, you you would know the production is a big big headache for people. So especially live events, uh, when you have to do the production, for a lot of sporting events, people used to uh, bring big trunks to the big trucks with a lot of equipment to the to the sporting events, and that used to cost literally millions of dollars per year for uh, for doing all of this. Today, what what is happening is. All of these are done remotely, so it's a remote production capability, and we are really powering that technology to enable remote production through very low latency network, using our edge solutions to make it all happen. Now, the switch, we didn't have a production capability, right? So the switch comes with the production capability, hmm. so and and that production capability uh, neatly dovetails to our offerings and it enhances our offerings as well. So uh, the 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 acquisitions rationale are uh, are of such kind that there is a strategic fit, which helps us to strengthen our product portfolio. It strengthens our market reach, and that's the reason behind acquiring this. And similarly, what we've announced in Calera, and now uh, Oasis as well, which we had invested before. They are in the eSIM business, and we just announced that we are you know, getting 100% of that company now. So, is your appetite for uh, fresh mergers and acquisitions still there, or are you kind of stocked up for the time being? No, I, I think the, you know. Thankfully, our balance sheet is uh, is quite strong, right? and we continue to generate good EBITDA and good cash. Um, so, it is part of our strategy that we will be on the lookout. We have created a strong team and capability to do that. But as I said, uh, you know, it's not as though we are going to be uh, uh, just depending on that. If there is the right opportunity that fits in strategically with what we do, then of course we will look at it. Take us through your fundraising uh, uh, plans that you have outlined. F fundraising plans. So um, you are talking about uh, no. I think a lot of these uh, acquisitions that we have done is uh, is all cash acquisitions. Most of mm. it is accrued internally. Mm. Uh, and of course, Calera is a bigger investment that we make, and that will be mm. a combination of uh, 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 cash and debt that we would uh, we would look at. Um, so yeah, I mean, we have clearly mapped out all sorts of funds, um, and um, uh, and we've also stated as part of our strategy, Siddharth, that our uh, you know net debt to EBITDA ratio will remain below two. Uh, mm. We are at one point three now. Uh, it was way high. If you remember, three, four years ago, we brought it down to where it is. But even at, uh, uh, at the ratio of two, we are quite comfortable. So we have sufficient headroom in our balance sheet to be able to to fund um, this and many more investments that we need to make and whenever uh, we need to make. Uh, uh, let me come back to uh, what's happening globally as far as the economy uh, is concerned. And uh, I want to add that questions from... Uh, to try and get some color from you as to what markets are active globally and uh, where do you see some of the additional growth uh, coming from in the future? Yeah. So globally, uh, you know, I'll, I'll come to the macro and, and you would have heard several commentaries on the macros, so uh, mm -hmm. I will leave that aside. 
But uh, to just put, give a perspective, so today our split of India revenues and international revenues are roughly 50-50, right? So, and, and with that kind of data revenues that we have, it's still very small relative to the, the market size that is available internationally. Right? So mm -hmm. if you look at the purely the network connectivity piece, which is one part of our portfolio, mm -hmm. the international is, uh, you know, at least uh, 50, 60 times more than what India market is. Even if I look at select markets, not just the global markets, right? Leaving alone, you know, some other markets like Latin America and others. So it's a big uh, uh, headroom available for growth because we are a challenger in those international markets while we are a leader in India. Uh, the white space available for that is uh, is very high. So regardless of how the macro movements are, which is temporarily, you know, there might be a slowdown uh, in people making decisions, which is what we noticed last quarter in terms of our funnel being very high, but the, the, the decision making was, uh, was slowing down. But in the long term, uh, the potential is uh, is very very huge, and uh, and that's where we're investing in in products and platforms that are truly global in nature, and we have our positioning to uh, to address those markets internationally as well. So uh, the today we are a small participant in the international market. Uh, the, the headroom available for growth is huge. We are challenging all the incumbents. Most of the uh, growth internationally. So this quarter we said, you know, our international has grown by about 16%. And the growth is coming more from replacing uh, current incumbents, if you will, and challenging their current incumbents. All right. Uh, very clearly uh, for Tata Communications, a new uh, journey has been underway for quite some time. And uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Lakshmi, for taking us through uh, the strategy in such detail. Uh, wishing you very all the very best for your future performance. You had a quick look at the stock also on the screen. I'm going to request my producers to bring that up again once. Uh, clearly, uh, the numbers have been digested and digested in a good and positive way. Uh, once again, thank you very much for your time uh, with us today. With that, it's a wrap on this conversation. We'll be back with more. Do stay tuned in. Bye-bye. Welcome, you're watching Business Today TV. I'm Sakshi Batra and this is a special edition where our focus is on the earnings season and the company on our radar today is